Hey, and welcome back to the X-Files Revisited. Today we're going to be looking at Aubrey, episode 12 of season 2. Debuting January 6, 1995 on the Fox Network, Aubrey is about a pregnant policewoman who, after experiencing some visions, discovers the body of two FBI agents who were on the trail of a serial killer some 50 years in the past. But now the murders have seemingly started back up and the only suspect is a 77-year-old man. The episode begins as Lieutenant Brian Tillman is working on a homicide investigation where the victim has the word sister carved across their chest. Inspector B.J. Morrow has something pressing on her mind that she needs to speak to Tillman about. Uh huh. And that couldn't have waited until later when he's at home with his wife, who knows absolutely nothing about this. He hands her an address to a motel they can meet at later to talk, although she seems pretty upset that he wants to take this to a motel, but I don't know. Don't get involved with people that are married, I guess? She makes it to the motel and starts to experience some kind of episode that I'm not sure is part of the whole pregnancy thing. <sighs> Holy shit, watch out BJ, it's Christine! She has a flashback of a man burying some bodies, and now this is definitely a symptom of being pregnant. At FBI HQ, Mulder and Scully go over the dental records of the remains dug up by BJ, and they seem to match those of a missing FBI agent who went missing 50 years prior while investigating what was then called stranger killings. But am I the only one who thinks this guy kinda looks like Jeffrey Combs? What's your interest in this case? During their time, Chandy's and Ledbetter's ideas weren't very well received by their peers. Using psychology to solve a crime was something like, um... Believing in the paranormal? Exactly. Mulder feels he has some kind of connection to the two men because he too has been dismissed for how he conducts his investigations, but that's not the only reason why he wants to go. Also, I've always been intrigued by women named BJ. The agents arrive on the scene where BJ tells them she found a dog digging in the area, which is why she started digging and found the bodies, which we know is a lie, because she just suddenly appeared there after being attacked by Christine. Yes, sir. So from that distance, you could see a dog digging in this field at night? Tillman interjects because he's more worried about his affair being exposed than anything else and explains that BJ was merely cutting through the field to reach a phone. But Mulder catches him by pointing out in the report it says she phoned from the motel just up the road. Have you ever had any clairvoyant experiences? Premonitions, visions, precognitive dreams, things like that? <laughs> what the hell kind of question is that? Tillman cuts him off over his ridiculous question, but Scully, using her womanly powers, knows there's more to this than meets the eye. He disabled them with a blow to the head. He would carve the word sister on their chests. Mulder recounts the serial killings that occurred in 1942, and Scully notices injuries on the skeletons of the two agents that seem to match up to those of the murders. Mulder, I don't think BJ was in the woods that night because of engine failure. What are you talking about? It's obvious BJ and Tillman are having an affair. <laughs> I love how oblivious Mulder is to BJ and Tillman's affair. If he would try an actual relationship, and not one of the blow-up variety, he just may learn something. They use some newfangled technology that will somehow show them what was carved on the agent's chest and see if it matches with what was carved into the other victims. BJ comes to check and see how the investigation is going when she starts having some flashbacks of someone aggressively shaving. You alright? She runs to the bathroom feeling sick to her stomach, giving Scully the perfect opportunity to pounce. I've had feelings for people I've worked with. Inner office relationships can be complicated, especially when he's married. Scully used her womanly intuition and knew she was having an affair and is pregnant. But BJ has been having odd nightmares about a man she kind of recognizes, a woman, and a lot of blood. I know what it says. On the rib cage, it spells brother. BJ somehow figures out the word that was carved on the agent's chest, but before anyone can celebrate, Killjoy Tillman arrives. Tillman starts having a hissy fit, claiming Mulder and Scully stole photographs from a case he's working on, not knowing the photos the agents have are from 1942. Three days ago, a young woman was murdered, and the word sister was carved into her chest and painted on the wall. Another cop arrives on the scene to tell him they just got word of another attack. 
they make their way to the scene to find another woman murdered with the word sister spelled out in her blood on the wall. It's the woman in my dream. That's not something you should be saying out loud. That you can't solve a crime from a dream. Well, I've often felt that dreams are answers to questions we haven't yet figured out how to ask. BJ tells Mulder more of these dreams she's been having, a woman in a house, a man's reflection in a mirror, and more blood. What does he look like? He's got a rash on his face, and his eyes are intense. She also remembers a strange photo behind the man with a weird looking structure which Mulder asks her to draw. It's a triangle in a circle, and yet Mulder somehow knows exactly what it is. What are you looking for? Just wanted to check on something. I don't get it, that book's from the 1940s. BJ is rudely interrupted by Tillman, who now suddenly wants to talk. He says he wants to go with her to her appointment, but she's no longer going as she's changed her mind, if you get what I'm saying. You can't just change your mind. This isn't your decision, it's our decision. BJ has more pressing matters as she finds the photo of the man she's been seeing in her dreams. Harry Coakley. He was convicted in 1945 for rape and attempted murder. It looks like they may have a suspect for who's been committing all the recent murders, except for the one glaring issue that he's 77 years old. Harry Coakley? Yeah. Oh yeah, this guy is definitely their man. Maybe he's on some of those magic pills Gung had. Mulder shows him a picture of one of the agents found, asking if Coakley had seen him before, and he gives the most unconvincing no I've ever seen. No. Mulder asks his whereabouts the previous night, but I mean look at him. He can't get anywhere without that damn oxygen tank. Coakley asks if they're done and Scully just glares at him, because anytime there's a female victim, she always seems to take it much more personal than if it's a man. BJ gets spooked from a nightmare and notices she has some blood on her hand. She runs to the bathroom and she must be a heavy sleeper because someone carved sister into her chest without waking her up. <laughs> Pregnancy really does some crazy shit to you. Some more flashbacks and she's suddenly in a random stranger's home pulling up the floorboards in their basement. Tillman arrives with the agents and wait a minute, who put this sack of bones here? Can you tell us what happened, BJ? Coakley. He was in the room. Coakley attacked you? She claims Coakley was the one that did this to her, but not current day old man Coakley. No, the younger 1940s Coakley. They bring the old man down to question him, but it should be very apparent this man can barely go to the bathroom, never mind attack someone. They checked it against Coakley's. The PGM subtype matches, the DQ alpha and the D1 DNA results from the recent victims somehow came back with a match for Coakley, and Mulder is in complete disbelief. The weird thing is if Coakley did attack BJ, why did he let her live? The agents decide to figure that out by visiting the one victim of Coakley's that managed to survive his attack back in the 1940s. I know this goes back a long way, Mrs. Thibodeau, but could you tell us what happened the night Harry Coakley attacked you? She starts talking about the attack when Mulder notices a picture on the wall that kind of resembles what BJ drew. And this somehow triggers him to ask her what happened to her son, Coakley's son, which seems to take Scully by surprise. I gave the baby to an adoption agency. Baby. They're almost 50 now. She hands the agents the information for the adoption agency where she gave up her son. Scully believes they have enough to pin the murders on Coakley, but Mulder still thinks something else is going on. He thinks that perhaps it's Coakley's grandson picking back up where his grandfather left off. Danny tracked down Mrs. Thibodeau's son. He was a policeman named Raymond Morrow. It's BJ's father. Well, this was quite the M. Night twist. What a twist! Mulder believes Coakley somehow genetically passed down his memories to BJ, and this has driven her to kill, without her even knowing it. Why does BJ suddenly have the same skin issues that Coakley does when she didn't before? Looking at a picture makes BJ snap too for a second, but then she snaps right back as Mrs. Thibodeau realizes BJ is her granddaughter. Don't know what you're doing! He's the one to blame! 
The agents arrive to Mrs. Thibodeau's place and find her on the steps, mostly unharmed as something made BJ stop her attack. Mulder puts out an APB on BJ and Scully thinks Tillman is going to be her next target, but Mulder disagrees and thinks it's Coakley that she's going after next. Coakley's not answering this phone. I'm going over there. At police HQ, Tillman starts losing it on Scully, but Mrs. Thibodeau confirms what Agent Scully is saying by telling Tillman BJ attacked her with a razor. Who's there? Someone is in Coakley's house and they cut the tube to his oxygen tank. I guess now he'll know what it feels like to be on the other side of this whole thing. How does it feel to be on the other side of the race, brother? I just said that. She slashes away at Coakley, meanwhile Mulder has made it to his place and is making his way around back. Well that was quite the cheap shot. BJ gets on top of Mulder, brandishing the straight razor and seeing the face of one of the murdered agents. I'm not BJ. Yes, you are. Ugh, why is Scully's fingernail so dirty? Coakley seemingly just dies from his wounds, which didn't appear to be all that serious if you're asking me, and it's like his hold on her just completely slips away. Oh wow, it's been a while since Scully has done some work on her computer. Well, BJ has been locked up, she's having psych evals done and is on watch because she apparently tried to end her pregnancy. Tillman meanwhile wants to adopt a child and I'm sure his wife is super thrilled about all of this. Aubrey is a decent episode but feels like familiar ground for the X-Files. Another person being taken over by someone or something but it's still fairly solid. I really would have loved to see Tillman's face when he had to explain all of this to his wife though. And look, I'm not shaming, but if Mrs. Thibodeau is her grandmother and her father is nearly 50, that would put BJ in her late 20s or somewhere in her 30s, but she doesn't exactly look like someone who would be in their 30s. And before I get someone coming at me about how old I think she looks, I said the same thing about Scully's ex-boyfriend in the episode Lazarus, and I'm still not buying that he's 38. The episode has a 7.3 on IMDb, and that works for me. It's solid, nothing bad, but nothing great either. Aubrey was written by Sarah B. Charno and is her first writing contribution to the series. The original concept focused solely on the idea of 50 year old murders and the sharing of memories through genetics. She eventually took this idea and expanded it including the idea of a female serial killer. Frequent writers Glenn Morgan and James Wong came aboard to help her flesh out this story a bit more. They quickly revised the story before shooting and added some newer scenes including the one where BJ attacks Mulder with the razor. Series creator Chris Carter was happy with how the episode came out, saying, I think it came out great. Rob Bowman came through for us and gave us an excellent job. Rob Bowman, the director, later came out and said that he was proud of the scene where BJ awakes with blood all over herself. Chris Carter also praised the casting for the episode, with highest praise going to Deborah Strang and Morgan Woodward, who we thought were both excellent and top-notch. Morgan Woodward played the role of old Harry Coakley. He was born September 16, 1925 and got his start in the 1956 film The Great Locomotive Chase. He had a long career and started many westerns as he had a very menacing presence. During casting, Morgan and Wong suggested Morgan for the role after having previously worked with him on 21 Jump Street. He would have one more role in the show Millennium and then retire, enjoying the rest of his days on his ranch until his eventual passing in 2019 at the age of 93. Deborah Strang played the role of B.J. Morrow. She was born November 12, 1950 and got her start in the anthology horror series Monsters. She's had a small but fairly consistent acting career with a recurring role on Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, and a voiceover role as Aunt May in the animated series The Spectacular Spider-Man. Her performance as B.J. was submitted for Emmy consideration, but ultimately she didn't make the list. Joy Coghill played the role of Linda Thibodeau. She was born May 13, 1926 and had a rather sporadic acting career starting with a 1955 series called Encounter. She would have a lot of small roles throughout her career but was in the 1987 horror film Blue Monkey. And can you guess what that one's about? I gotta get closer. It's about a giant ant. Joy passed away on January 20th, 2017 at the age of 90. And finally, Terry O'Quinn, who played the role of Lieutenant Brian Tillman. He was born July 15th, 1952, and got his start in the 1980 made-for-TV movie, FDR, The Last Year. 
Of all the actors in this episode, he by far has had the biggest career. From a 1987 psychological horror film like The Stepfather, to 120 episodes in the hit series Lost, he's definitely made a name for himself in the industry. Aubrey is a decent episode that I think is worth your time. Like I said, it's not amazing, but I think it's fairly solid and will make for a decent viewing. But don't go far, because next up is one of the creepiest episodes of the series when we're introduced to a fetishist who collects pieces of the dead in Irresistible. Well, I hope you enjoyed our look at Aubrey, and if you did, please hit that like button. It really does help me out. Also, please think about becoming a subscriber. It would mean a lot to me. Let me know down in the comments what you think of Aubrey. Thank you all for watching, and stay spooky. Friday. I'd like to know why this policewoman would suddenly dig up the bones of a man who's been missing for 50 years. A killer from the past. You're sure it was him? I know it was him. Has returned. Word sister was carved into her chest. To start a new generation of terror. The X-Files, Friday at 9, 8 central.